I am delighted to uh, welcome you along with Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll uh, to this morning's announcement. We're delighted to be here with Senate President Karen Spilka, uh, Rep. Jim O'Day, Representative Hogan. Um, I'm going to just go down the line here. <laughs> Rep. Tom, <laughs> Senator Di Domenico, Rep. Howard. Where are we going? Yeah, all right, we've got. Yes, we've got Representative Lewis, we, uh, Senator Lewis, forgive me. Representative Lewis, right. Uh, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Oh, that's right. Don't be promoted. Representative Garlic. All right. Let's see. Leader Hogan. Senator Sear, right? Terrific. Okay. And we mentioned you. You did. Yes. Uh, and you got the right tie on. Um, honestly, so it's wonderful to be here with so many terrific colleagues from the legislature. And we are also delighted to be joined by members of our own administration, uh, Se uh, Secretary of Education, Dr. Pat Tutwiler, and the team, uh, including our Commissioner of Elementary and Secondary Education, Jeff Riley, uh, Chair of uh, the Board of DESE, Catherine Craven, and also members of the Board of uh, Elementary and Secondary Education. We have uh, also with us Associate Commissioner uh, Rochelle Engler-Bennett and Assistant Director Kristen McKinnon, in the Office of Student and Family Support, who worked very hard to get us to this day, and we appreciate that. Youth safety advocates, including Mary Kay uh, Wisniewski of Sandy Hook Promise, who made the trip up today, we very much appreciate your being here. Ellen Frank, President and CEO of Planned Parenthood League of Massachusetts, Polly Crozier of GLAD and Dan Barris of GLSEN, our educator leaders, uh, Max Page, the Mass Teachers Association, Brant Duncan, the American Federation of Teachers, and Jessica Tang from the Boston Teachers Union. And uh, importantly, we also have a student with us today, Alia uh, Cusolito from Old Rochester Regional High School in Mattapoisett, who is an accomplished advocate for young people. Also here with us today are Mass Equality, Mass Commission on LGBTQ Youth, Mass Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence, ADL New England, as well as pediatricians and, and health experts. We're here today because nothing is more important than the health and the well-being of our young people. That's what today is about. This is especially critical now, given all that's happened in the last few years with the pandemic. Our young people have experienced a real surge in uh, documented uh, mental health conditions. And we owe it to them to empower them with resources, with knowledge, with the tools they need to be successful. We also owe it to our schools to provide the support and the information that they need to help deliver the best education experience possible. So I'm pleased to announce today that we are proposing an update of the state's comprehensive health and physical education framework. This is the framework that guides our school districts in how they teach health and phys ed at each level from pre-K through 12th grade. These guidelines need to be age appropriate. They need to address and engage the full range of a young person's experiences and identities. They need to be grounded in science. So it may surprise some to learn that these frameworks have not been updated in nearly 25 years. This is the first update in 19, since 1999. And a lot in our world has changed, to say the least, um, since 1999. Uh, new technologies, the infusion of social media, uh, a lot more knowledge about physical health, mental health, nutrition, substance use risks, the way we talk about personal safety, dating violence, bullying, all of these things, imagine. So this is an update, long in the making, hasn't happened since 1999, and we're really pleased to be able to announce this away. Um, it is so important uh, to do this, it was long overdue, and the updates we are proposing here today have been carefully uh, researched. They've been informed and reviewed by panels of experts of more than 40 educators and health experts. They seek to incorporate a real up-to-date understanding of health and wellness and its importance in education and in supporting all of the opportunities we want for our children and our young people. These updates are also inclusive. They recognize gay, queer, and trans students' identities and needs. That's important, and it's not something we're gonna shy away from. Our LGBTQ plus students face higher risks of mental health issues, including anxiety, depression, and suicidality. That's just a fact. 
They need and deserve to be supported, educated, and empowered for who they are, just like every other student. This framework addresses all of the health and wellness needs of our students. Here's what it covers. Mental and emotional health, personal safety, including bodily autonomy, dating safety, violence prevention, physical health and hygiene, nutrition and balanced eating, physical activity and fitness, substance use and misuse, gender, sexual orientation, and sexual health, and public community and environmental health. It also outlines appropriate expectations for what students should know and be able to do at each stage of their education with strategies to enhance their own mental, emotional, and physical health along the way. We've seen, unfortunately, how some states are moving backwards, making it harder for educators to teach, making it harder for young people to learn, to learn about really important things, their mental health, their physical health, their safety, and their well-being. But that's not how we do things in Massachusetts. We prioritize the needs of our young people, and we support the educators and others who work with them. I believe strongly, as I know is the sentiment shared by all who I'm privileged to stand with, that our students deserve inclusive, medically accurate, and age-appropriate health guidelines. That's what these guidelines provide. They are going to empower our students with the skills they need to build healthy lives now and beyond. There's a process that moves forward uh, from today's announcement. The Board of Elementary and Secondary Education at its regular meeting next week on June 27th will hear a presentation on the draft framework and vote on whether to send it out for public comment. If the board votes to do so, then educators, parents, advocates, and members of the public will have 60 days to comment. After the comment period, DESE will consider the feedback and bring the draft back to the board for a vote on adoption. Again, I thank to everyone at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, to all the students, educators, administrators, health experts who collaborated to deliver these high quality guidelines for our students. Let's remember that Massachusetts is home to the first public school in the country, the first public library, and we were the first to pioneer universal access to health care. Those are some of our hallmarks and calling cards and values and uh, for a lot of people over very, very many years. And this is a continuation of that and an affirmation of those values and principles. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to our Secretary of Education, Pat Tutwiler. Can everyone hear me okay? The mic is a little bit lower. <laughs> Good morning. We do, we do, yes. Um, thank you, Governor, uh, to be here this morning, uh, along with the Governor, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, Driscoll Commissioner Riley, and, and in this room full of educators, uh, administrators, health advocacy groups, LBGTQ plus advocacy groups, and everyone else who makes up our education family in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'm Secretary of Education, Pat Tutwiler, and as Governor Healy indicated, we are very excited about this morning's announcement. I strongly believe in the comprehensive, inclusive, and age-appropriate curriculum framework proposed. By providing our students from pre-K to 12 uh, with the best up-to-date best practices around health and wellness, we can better prepare the next generation of students for lifelong health. That is a, this is exactly the right time to update our health and physical education curriculum framework. Our education system is still recovering from the lasting impacts of the pandemic, and this new framework will provide students and educators access to modern, scientifically-backed practices for achieving mental and physical health. Since I took on the role of secretary some six months ago, this has been one of the most asked about topics as I met with educators, administrators, and school stakeholders across the state. Educational leaders have been encouraging us to make this move to help our students get up-to-date health and physical education curriculum framework they deserve. And I'm pleased to report that we are delivering. 
Massachusetts students deserve health and physical education frameworks that engage the full range of their experiences and identities. We want all of our students, regardless of their identity, to have access to the education they need and to be healthy and safe. Massachusetts students also deserve health and physical education guidelines that are developmentally and age appropriate and grounded in science. We want all of our students to benefit, benefit from the evidence-based guidelines that have been carefully researched. I want to take a quick moment uh, to say that the reason why I believe so strongly in our draft uh, framework is because I know the intention, the effort, and the information that went into it. I am so proud of each and every one of the members at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education who spent countless hours on this framework and the effort of all the students, educators, administrators, health experts, and other community members and stakeholders across the state uh, and across the field of education who collaborated to deliver such a high quality guideline. Together, we've crafted nation-leading guidelines for health, well-being, and physical fitness. And I'm proud to champion them forward. I'd now like to turn the mic over to uh, the chair of the Board of Elementary and Secondary Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and thank you, Governor Healy. Um, as the chair of the Board of Education, I'm pleased to bring these frameworks forward for consideration by the board next Tuesday as championed by Commissioner Jeff Riley and the staff of DESE who have been working on this with the volunteer expert panelists, as the governor mentioned, dozens of experts in fields far and wide since 2018. These have been under construction. As a mom of five public school graduate or current children in, in Brookline, Massachusetts, and my son John is here right now, um, they age and range from 23 to 6. So again, my oldest daughter was two years old when the last, you know, it's 1999 is a long time. And you think about what's happened, right? So I've got several generations of children. Some have gone through the old frameworks, and my youngest, who's six, will go through the new frameworks. And you think about who these kids are today, right? They have had a, their linear education disrupted by a nearly two-year cessation in unconstrained in-person learning. They have consumed media at younger ages and at their fingertips than any other generation which has also exposed them to social upheaval unlike children of any other generation. We hear from teachers and principals across the Commonwealth that mental health and behavioral disruptions are occurring at unprecedented levels. These frameworks provide an outline of age-appropriate practices that will benefit social and emotional development of the Commonwealth asset, our children. The state has the outline. It is up to the local school committees and school superintendents to select the curriculum and implement the delivery of these frameworks. And I encourage every family and everyone in this room to understand and get involved as your districts go out and, and implement this, this new law, or the new regulations, hopefully, that will be voted on by the board next Tuesday. But here are some of my highlights in favor of them. Having a framework which emphasizes the importance of loving adults and child build healthy relationships. That's in there. Having a framework young people to avoid and exercise healthy choices. That's having a framework which emphasizes treating others with dignity and respect. Having a framework which alerts children to the existence of health inequities locally, nationally, and internationally. A framework that emphasizes above all for every grade level compassion. And having a framework which emphasizes providing valid and reliable health information, products, and resources, not reliance upon schoolyard birds and the bees discussion and analogies is helpful to all. This is just the first step. The board, of the board as, we, as Governor Healy mentioned, will vote next Tuesday. And then the hardest work of all, which is will begin with local school administrators and families. It is worthy work. Facts are antidote to fear. Thank you. Thank you so much. Chair Craven, um, also for your service uh, in leading the board. And now it's my privilege to introduce our Senate President, Karen Spilka. Thank you, Governor. I am really thrilled to be here standing with all of you today as we move forward with finally updating our health and physical education framework 
for the 21st century. I really thank the Healy Driscoll administration for getting this done. When kids can find out just about anything on the internet, it's well past time for them to be able to access information that is comprehensive, inclusive, medically accurate, and developmentally and age appropriate at the very least. It is our responsibility and obligation to help provide that. At our best, we should be empowering students to make informed decisions that lead healthy lives and healthy relationships. And that begins with inclusive and medically accurate health and sex education for all those who want it. I'm very proud that the Senate has voted overwhelmingly to pass Healthy Youth, the Healthy Youth Bill during every session since I've been Senate President. Uh, I'd like to uh, note that uh, Senator Sal Di Domenico reminds me that it's four times we've passed that. So I'm really proud of this, and I want to specifically thank Senator Sal Di Domenico for his unwavering dedication to this issue and raising it every Senate session. I'd also like to acknowledge representatives in the House who have championed this, Representative Jim O'Day and Vanna Howard, uh, for all of their hard work on this issue. But I am really grateful to Governor Healy for advancing this framework at a time when it is so very needed for all of the reasons you heard. I won't go into it all again. But the, be, be advised and note that the Senate will continue to do all it can do to support our students, whether it be funding social and emotional learning initiatives in the budget, or passing once again the Gender X Bill that will allow for a non-binary option in government documents. Here in Massachusetts, our commitment to upholding the rights of our res residents and celebrating, really celebrating our diversity is our com competitive advantage. Our state leaders will never be afraid to say gay, and our students and educators should never be afraid to either. To To our students, we all up here say, we see you and we want you to be exactly who you are. And to everyone who has advocated to get us here today, on behalf of the Massachusetts Senate, I say thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, President Spilka. Uh, also joining us from the House this morning, Representative Sean Garbley is with us, and we want to invite our uh, colleague, uh, Leader Jim O'Day, to the podium. Good morning. Can you imagine I was only 22 the last time they upgraded this thing? No, you can't. <laughs> wow. This is a great day, folks. I really can't thank the governor and her staff and the you know, lieutenant governor for bringing this issue forward with her administration, with the secretary, with the commissioner. Job well done, and thank you very much for all the work you've done on this today. To this administration's historic administration proves how committed the governor to your to our youth our education system, the LGBTQ plus population, and reproductive health care. I just want to speak for one moment to all the advocates. I want to say thank you. After 10 years, I probably would have fired me. Uh, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for hanging in there. Thank you for all of your assistance. Thank you for all of your perseverance. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to help represent this incredibly important issue. I also want to thank my longtime partner, Senator D Sal Di Domenico, who has been a, a real workhouse, a real workhorse on the Senate side. Representative Vanna Howard, who has been a tremendous uh, opportunist since coming here with this bill. 
Uh, I think every time the speaker saw her coming to talk, he would say, oh my God, we have to talk about this bill again. But thank you, Vanna, for all of your work on this issue. Obviously, this issue has been long overdue. Right now, however, is exactly the right time to finally update the Commonwealth's antiquated comprehensive health framework. Today, several southern states either prohibit sex educators from dis discussing LGBTQ plus identities and relationships or require sex educators to frame LGBTQ plus identities in a, in a relationship negatively. We will not do that in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In my district in Worcester, we have some of the highest teen pregnancy and teen STI rates in the Commonwealth. The updated framework will teach young people about consent and healthy relationships. All our students, the future generation of the Commonwealth, will thrive when they receive evidence-based, modern education based on science and fact. I am so thankful that we have the governor today who recognizes the importance of investing in our students, overall well-being, and has taken action. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Representative, for your words. Uh, we're going to hear now from our student speaker, Alia Kusulito who again attends Old Rochester Regional High School. We welcome you to the podium. Hi everyone, um, my name is Alia Cusolito, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm a rising senior at Old Rochester Regional High School. I'm also on the Massachusetts GSA Leadership Council, and I'm co-president and head of outreach for the national nonprofit Queer Youth Assemble. In the past, I've also worked with Fenway Health and the Glisten Shine team. It's extremely important to me, my peers, teachers, and parents that students are taught comprehensive sex education. A few years ago, I actually submitted testimony for the Healthy Youth Act, and these topics are still just as important. I've had some opportunities through Bagley and other groups I'm connected with to learn more comprehensive sex ed, and I can say with confidence that many people in those rooms were surprised by and grateful for the information they were able to learn. Our education system had been so lacking up to now. I've heard from numerous other queer students regarding the inappropriate questions that many of us get asked by our peers. They sometimes feel like they're being treated as encyclopedias, and our peers' lack of knowledge leads to uncomfortable and potentially unsafe experiences for everyone. Personally, I've even had my biology teacher ask me questions about the correct terminology to use. I really, really appreciated his willingness to learn and improve, but this demonstrates the information that even teachers are lacking. In addition, education about safe relationships can allow students to know what is and isn't okay and be comfortable and happy in all areas of their lives. The true meaning of Pride Month is the ongoing work we all do to advocate for liberation, joy, and safety for all people. Thank you to the governor and to everyone involved in this important work. Updating our curriculum is vital to raising healthy youth. Thank you so much, Alia, for coming up today and for sharing your perspective with all who are, all who are here. Really, really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to invite our Lieutenant Governor to the, to the podium, and then I'm going to return if there are questions. But you know, Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll uh, brings such a wealth of perspective and experience to this. She's the mother of three. Um, she chaired her school committee. And uh, I just want to invite her to, to share her words. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate that. I think this is a really important day for all the, the, the previous speakers, all the items mentioned. I just want to share, as someone who chaired a school committee on the ground locally, how important this is. A lot of conversations happening across the Commonwealth. And to be able to have a framework, like we do for science, like we do for math, like we do to ensure we have the best literacy programs, that we have the K through 12 mapping when it comes to the, the work that goes beyond uh, educating our students, and to ensure that every single one of our kiddos can feel safe, 
respected, heard as their authentic self, that's how you create a self and healthy learning community. That's how you create empathy within our schools. And that's how you create stronger communities and a stronger commonwealth. So I'm grateful that so many folks have championed this and really proud of being part of an administration that's willing to put into work to make sure it happens. It's not just talk, it's action, and it starts with all of us. So thank you, Governor. Any questions? Governor, how confident are you that you get buy-in on the local level? Is this a voluntary? Isn't there a lot of pushback on the local level to things like this? I think we'll, we'll both probably respond to that. Um, you know, I think look, look behind us, right? I mean, look at look at the range of stakeholders, and you know, um, no matter what your your child is interested in, what motivates them, uh, what they're concerned about. I mean, all parents and families have a vested interest in making sure that their children have an opportunity to feel good about themselves, to grow in self-esteem and confidence, to learn, to be able to take advantage of a big world out there, to feel supported. And I think that's a unifying theme. I don't know a parent who doesn't want that for their child. And so I think it's with that we enter this. I think it was our obligation as a state to serve up a framework, as the LG says, a framework that covers something that you know is absolutely essential and vital, and to then encourage and work work going forward with with the districts and you know seeing seeing people take this up. And I and I think the chair uh, spoke to that. So I, I feel that you know people are united in that in that effort. Our educators are here, and we really appreciate you know all they do day in and day out. And and this is an opportunity, as I say, 25 years. 25 years, so it's it's about time, and I'm sure there's an appetite for that. So agreed. Yeah. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> I don't mean to suggest they're laughable. I just think they're in need of update. You know, um, my, my mother was a school nurse. She also taught health education and sex education. And, you know, I think about uh, what she was teaching and how things were approached at a time that my brothers and sisters and I were going through school. And the fact of the matter is, since then, and I'm a lot older than somebody who went to school in the 90s, um, you know, I think about how much has changed in the last 25 years almost. And so, you know, as I said earlier, there's new information about nutrition, new information about recognizing the signs of uh, mental health issues. There's new information related to personal safety, treating one another with respect, bodily integrity, dating violence. These are things that haven't been talked about or, or engaged with in this kind of way with the new science and study and research and understanding that is informing these, these frameworks. Secretary Tutwiler, is there anything in, else in particular? Um, but is perfect? Yeah. Okay, I get an A. Uh, but, but there's a lot there, Bruce, and that's why I think the time was taken to, to work directly with experts uh, to make sure these things are, are included. So, uh, sure, it is about sex education, uh, but it is about a whole lot more than that. And I think in a time and an age where, you know, what is happening in particular with mental health and, and the well-being of our young people is something that is on the minds of most families and most parents right now, really. You know, um, we've seen increased anxiety, increased depression, uh, increased, increased suicidality, suicidality in some instances. You know, we've got to do everything, and we can. This is a means you know, towards advancing that by providing frameworks that will help educators and students and communities move forward. It's about empowerment, bottom line. So what did so long to get this done? Um, well, we started in January. <laughs> it sounds like it's been going on for years before this. Well, I can't speak to all the history of this. I know that Commissioner Riley and the team at DESE have worked very, very hard um, and I appreciate the work over the last uh, several months to, to get this to a place where we feel really confident about its medical accuracy, about its scientific 
uh, rigor and, and uh, that it's based in, in evidence. And so we're really pleased to be able to, to make this recommendation and to have it go before the board next week. And you know, my, my view is this has been long overdue and I appreciate the efforts in the legislature to move forward uh, with, with uh, this as a, as a legislative matter. But you know, um, DLG and I feel strongly that you know, our job is to come in here and, and make sure that we're moving the ball. Um, and I appreciate the work of, of Secretary Tutwiler and his team and we also appreciate the work of the commissioner and his team. And we stand ready to work with communities to support. You heard from somebody who was a leader and mayor in her community and charity school board. Um, so, you know, we come to this with a spirit of, of goodwill and optimism um, that there is a recognition that we need to do this. We need to do this for our young people right now. Well, from what I'm hearing, it's sounding pretty similar. Uh, my expectation is that it would be pretty quite similar. Uh, and I think maybe just to respond a little bit to one of the questions. So, in the 1999 version, they only talk about abstinence. Okay, in, in this curriculum, there would be discussion beyond just abstinence. There would be discussion about contraception. 1999, they didn't talk about that. Our children are aware of those issues probably learning about it regrettably in the schoolyard. We need to give them a much better approach to, that's just two small issues that I think is an important thing to, to point out here this morning. Yeah, so then, we, yeah, I have a, a very soft-spoken. Um, <laughs> so the, the, the framework that we had in the Senate was, was very similar to what is, was being done now. Uh, over time, we've passed several iterations of the bill. Uh, we've had a consent to it, healthy relationships over time as well. And we're very just happy that the, the framework now addresses all the issues that were in the bill. But implementation, obviously, is key. Uh, and also making sure that this gets to the local level in, in the current form. So uh, for us, in the Senate, the Senate President has been very, very supportive of this and obviously uh, supportive of, of getting it done uh, legislatively. But also, I want to thank the governor. The governor, you know, obviously took 25 years and it took them six months um, to get something done, which is pretty remarkable and in, in that in itself. So I just wanted to thank, uh, thank them. But we're very happy. We're finally going to see some results here. And as Representative O'Dave said, the abstinence-only model that was being taught in our schools doesn't work for our kids. It uh, never worked for our kids. Uh, we had a head in the sand for many, many years, thinking that if we don't talk about it, things aren't getting talked about among our, our kids. I have two boys of my own who are now, one's going off to college, which didn't have, you know, think about that. You know, we had a whole generation of kids going by our school system that weren't taught this curriculum, and now going off to college and beyond, but having those, that information that they needed that they can make informed decisions, and having short-term and long-term ramifications because of that. So uh, we recognize today this is a special day, an important day for our kids, and making sure that we have the, given the tools to make informed decisions on medically accurate, age-appropriate information going forward. So thank you much. I think we've heard from superintendents that they're anxious for the updated framework. There was a question earlier about what's taken so long, right? Uh, I came in 2018 and we started the process in earnest of getting this uh, moving. Uh, obviously, we were kind of waylaid by COVID for a few years uh, and we've got it back across the finish line now. But there's a process that takes place. Uh, we put this out. The board will have questions on Tuesday where, I mean, they should really have their first kind of bite at the apple at this. Uh, then we'll hear from public comments, we'll shape it, and then the board will decide to vote up or down uh, later in the summer, early in the fall. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think um, superintendents are asking for, for direction uh, on uh, where we're going as far as health frameworks. And now more than ever after COVID, uh, this is needed.
Well, um, I'm not a public health expert. I'm just your governor. Um, I will tell you, though, that the team that was assembled, the panel, really consists of the very best when it comes to public health, when it comes to education, and when it comes to you know, the, the overall design and construction of these frameworks. And you're absolutely right. It looks different for children at different ages and in different grades. And that's what we mean by not just evidence-based, but age-appropriate. And so um, you'll see all the specifics of that laid out. But I just want to underscore that you know, we should be uh, focused, in my view, and I'll just offer this, in my view, it is, uh, and particularly in Massachusetts, where we do value education, where we value access to health care, uh, where we protect civil rights, you know, we should make sure that our young people from their earliest days have the love and support. This gets into things like food security, housing security, uh, you know, big things that we're all trying to move and, and, and work through, uh, as well as education and making sure that they have the education that they need, no matter their age, right? Everybody needs, everybody needs to, to be learning something, just different things at different ages. Everybody, we're all coming into this world learning each day. So everybody needs to have the opportunity to learn each day something that's going to help their mental health, their emotional health, their physical health. And you know, I think this is incredibly important and I look forward to districts who are interested. Districts are interested in making sure that in their communities, their kids are receiving what they need to ensure healthy outcomes. It breaks my heart when I read something of a story of something happening to a young person out there that's, that's negative, that's harmful, that's hurtful. And you know, part of what this is is an effort to make sure we're heading that off and empowering young people uh, at an early age and through their growth and development and maturation with basic knowledge and information that they need. And I just want to go back to something that Chair Craven said and that facts are uh, an antidote to fear. <coughs> facts are an antidote to fear and we should, we should remember that and not be afraid uh, to talk about facts. Thank you very much for being here.